Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. So glad that you are here, um, especially if you're new. We're really glad you came over. So today we're finishing up a series that we've been doing on anxiety and worry that we've been calling Calm the Home Down. And so we're going to uh, wrap that up uh, today. So why don't you go to the passage that we've been looking at. We're going to keep working through that in Philippians chapter 4. That's in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. Don't be afraid to use the table of contents. And if you need a Bible, why don't you just raise your hand and the ushers will come down in the aisles right now and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those. You can even keep it if you need a Bible. While you're turning there, uh, let me just uh, add my weight to a couple of things. First, uh, next Sunday, the big Super Bowl outreach, Super Sunday. Let there be uh, just no confusion because one or two people asked this past week, now, we're not like selling our souls to football, right? We're not worshiping football. And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> and let the record show clearly, we worship Jesus. We're using football to reach people for Jesus. This is an outreach. I want you to bring people so that they can hear the gospel on a day that the world is focused on football. All right. It's going to be an awesome opportunity. You be uh, thinking about who you're going to bring and invite along uh, to come with you next Sunday. And then a second thing that I was thinking about uh, today, a number of you said on the first Sunday of the new year, I'm going to come to all four Sundays of the Call the Home series down and look at you. You did it. You're here. So that's awesome. Congratulations. But now I want to give you a challenge because I know the tendency um, is for us to sort of let the gas pedal off when we've made a little progress spiritually and say that will sustain me for a while. I really want to caution you against doing that. Um, I want you to, to consider this. Two weeks from today, after the Super Bowl outreach next week, two weeks from today, we're going to start a new series that we're calling Joy Full because I'm convinced that we need a little bit more joy in our stressed out lives. And so I want you to come and be a part of all the Sundays in February as well. In a culture that continues to grow more kind of once a month, once every six weeks, once every eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, and you can't figure out why am I feeling so flat spiritually? Well, maybe that's just having something to do with it. So I want you to be here two weeks from today when we start the new Joyful series. And what we're going to do is go back early in the book of Philippians, and we're going to go from that uh, side this time in that series. It's going to be great. So I want you to be a part of that. This series, uh, I think, has definitely struck a chord with any number of you. You've told me so, if not here, even out in the community when I've run into some of you at grocery stores and other such places. And uh, I'm really glad that this has been helpful. It is. Anxiety is a prevalent uh, problem, isn't it, in our lives and in our world uh, today. I was reminded of that even a couple of weeks ago. I got a text one night from one of our people here who said, oh, pastor, pray for me. I'm very nervous, very worried because the doctor called and said he needs me to come back for a blood test, further blood test. It might be leukemia or it's, it's like serious. I could tell he was freaked out. And when I saw him the next Sunday and just saw the hollow look in his eyes that had that look of a, of a serotonin starved brain that's carrying on a thousand conversations at the back of the mind that are telling you, you're going to die and it's all over and it's hopeless. I, I thought to myself, yep, I know that look, bless your heart. And, uh, but hey, you know, I've told you several uh, self-deprecating stories of my own, so I get it. I've walked the path and can certainly relate to those sorts of feelings. Um, as a matter of fact, his story reminded me of one such story um, that I had. So I'll tell you one more because um, these kind of stories tend to humanize me and normalize you. And that's a pretty good relationship for a pastor to have with his people, right? So years ago, I got a phone call from the nurse at my doctor who said, we need you to come back in uh, because your PSA has uh, gone up. 
I said, oh my gosh. I said, what's the PSA? And she said, well, that's the test that measures uh, prostate cancer. I was like, oh no. And so I said, when can I come? I'll be there this afternoon. No, no, we don't have an open space until you know, six days from now. You don't want to give a high functioning hypochondriac six days. <laughs> and so in those six days, I'm telling you, I got to know about prostate cancer. I read everything there was to know about prostate cancer. And by the time, you know, I, I finished, I, I was just hobbling around and I was like, I've got it. I just know I've got it. And it's probably stage four and maybe stage five if they have that, I don't know. And so finally the day came and I got to the doctors and I was sitting there and the doctor walked in and he said, well, what do you, you were just here. What are you doing back here so soon? So well, I guess to hear much, hear how much longer I've got to live, and uh, <laughs> give it to me. You know, tell me about my cancer-laden prostate. And he looks at the clipboard and he's like, "Oh, good grief! Your your number went up a fraction uh, of a. I got to work with this nurse. She's not understanding what it is that." that I want. She should have never called you. She should have I am so sorry. I will tell them you do not have to pay a charge uh, for today. Oh my goodness. I walked out. I felt so liberated until I got about halfway home. And then I thought, you know, I ought to turn right around and go back and tell him you owe me money, buddy, for all the hours of my time this past week that I spent researching and worrying and fretting about prostate cancer because I just knew I had it. Because your nurse didn't know how to call the person or not to call the person. And I think you need to pay me some money. So <clears throat> um, I was thinking about that story, and then read about this time on Wednesday night, I got a text back from the person that I was telling you about, and he said, hey, good news, all the tests came back, uh, negative, there's no problem, doctor says I'm healthy from top to bottom. You know, one study that I uh, read about worry indicates that only 8% of the things that we spend worrying about are legitimate matters of concern. The other 92% are imaginary, or they never happen, or they involve matters over which we have no control anyhow, which means we spend a lot of time in needless worry, don't we? Okay, now I know, I know, I know, I know. I know sometimes there really is the real thing. Some of you are like, but I really got the real thing. I mean, even this past week, it's like, I really do have the, you know, are you making light? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not making light of that. Okay, and nor am I making light of the fact that we do live in a world that there is terrorism and, and one hears more talk about nuclear war than I remember since the 1980s. Um, and <clears throat> so, yes, I understand that. But let's realistically evaluate. You and I, we do not live, not in this part of the world, we do not live under the imminent threat of danger that our Christian counterparts do in some parts of the world that are Christian hostile. That, that we just don't live in that reality. And they're certainly not in the, in the reality that the early Christians 2,000 years ago lived in, where any given day, you, they didn't know whether the Roman government might find them out in their underground catacomb caves where they would hide and worship. And they didn't know whether they might be hauled off and arrested and, and beheaded and crucified and all sorts of things. And yet, even though that was the reality that those Christians were living in, even though Paul himself was writing from prison, is he pushing the panic button? Never. He kept telling them, hey, let's keep a perspective about this. If you live, then praise the Lord. You get some more time to tell other people about Jesus. But if you die... Praise the Lord. You get to be with Jesus. So you win either way. He had this perspective that was just altogether different than the perspective uh, that we find ourselves wrestling with. So here's what I want us to do is I want us to pick right up where we left off last time in Philippians 4, and we're going to go to verse 8, and let's start in right there. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, I misread that. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace 
will be with you. Now, from this text and a few others that I'm going to reference, we're going to get three things today. If you're a note taker, I'm going to tell you what the three things are, and then we'll go back and work through them. First thing we're going to talk about is where the anxiety battleground is. Where, what is the battleground? Second thing we're going to talk about is who is our battle with? Who's the enemy? And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about how do we win the battle? Okay, so let's talk about, first of all, where is the anxiety battle fought? Look at verse 8. After he lists all these wonderful qualities, he says, I want you to think about these things. Where do you do your thinking? You do your thinking in the mind. The mind is the battleground for anxiety and worthy and worry. In other words, the single most effective weapon that we have against worry is about three pounds and it resides in your head between your ears. That is your mind. And what Paul is telling us is we have to learn how to exert discipline over this part of our lives, which many of us have never given any thought about. As a matter of fact, there was a preacher about 150 years ago, Alexander McLaren was his name, and he wrote, lots of us have thoughts that just hook onto one another by the slightest links of accidental connection. And subsequently, we're being mastered by the thoughts in our mind rather than mastering our thoughts. And you know what, 150 years later, we're no better today. In his helpful book on, uh, on anxiety, Max Lucado says, look, you didn't get to select your birthplace. You didn't select your birth date. You didn't get to select your parents. You didn't choose your siblings. There's so many things about which you don't have any choice, but you do get to choose what you think about. And so you can be the air traffic controller of your mind because you occupy the control tower and you can direct the traffic in your mind's world. So thoughts are circling above and they only get permission to land if you let them land. And when they take off, they're taken off because you said, get out of here. And so you can select your thought pattern. But the question is, will you? do that? Will you exert that authority to take your thoughts captive for Christ? I remember making a fledgling, clumsy effort in the right direction for the first time in my life along these lines back when I was in college years ago. I was pledging a fraternity. It was my second semester of college. And the things, and I'm telling you, it was pure undiluted hazing that they did back in those days. Maybe that's against the law or not legal or something anymore. Probably shouldn't be. It definitely shouldn't be. But anyhow, um, I was going through um, this and there's all of this mental stress and exhaustion and I'm getting stretched in all of these different directions. Meanwhile, I'm trying to keep my grades, but my grades are, are falling precipitously. And <clears throat> I'm freaking out and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to get kicked out of here. And it's my freshman year. And I remember one night I was talking to my wonderful mom on the phone and I was lamenting what was going on and whimpering to her and, and back here in Houston. And, and, and she said, well, honey, could you just ask them to go a little bit lighter on you? And I said, no, that's about the worst thing that I could do. And perhaps I should have just bailed out and de-pledged, but I'm glad in hindsight that I didn't because of what God was going to teach me in that season of voluntary persecution that I signed up for. It was in that season that one morning, I don't know, I hearkened back to a sermon that I'd heard or I read an article or something about what we're talking today. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take authority over my thoughts. And I got my Bible out that had never gotten as much use as it was going to get in that season. Um, and I began to underline verses, and I began to memorize those verses, and I began to meet with the Lord every morning for some devotional time because I had the distinct sense, my life depends on this right now or else I'm going to go haywire. And, and so I was meeting with the Lord, and I was drawing near to him, and I was praying prayers like you read in, in, in Matthew 6. I was saying, Lord, in Matthew 6, you say, hey, you don't have to worry. Don't worry. Do the flowers worry? 
Do the lilies of the field worry? No. And do I take care of them? Yes. And I'll do the same for you. So don't worry. I say, God, I'm taking you at your word. You say you're going to treat me as well or better than the flowers of the lilies. So I'm not going to worry. And an interesting thing began to happen. As I began to cling to the Lord, as I began to say, I'm saying no to panic. I'm saying no to all of these anxious thoughts. I'm saying no to when I crawl in bed and I lie down and I start thinking, what am I going to tell people? And I tell them, I failed out of Vanderbilt because I tried this stupid fraternity and I failed. I'm not going to think any of those things. When those thoughts start to encroach, I'm going to put my mind on Christ. I'm going to put my mind on these verses that I'm memorizing and I'm going to move Forward. It was the first time in my life that I actually exerted a little energy in the right direction of taking authority over my mind. And the subsequent result was that I actually grew peaceful. Imagine that. He says in verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. And I was experiencing that very thing. My grades they weren't the best that semester, but they were good enough. I made it through, and I finally got initiated in the fraternity and got through that nonsense. But the best thing of, of that whole season for me was that for the first time, I really began to learn what it meant to cling to Christ and to take authority over my mind for Jesus and with Jesus. And so <clears throat> you say, well, that sounds good. I would like to do that, but like, how do I do it? Well, here's the thing. Paul gives us this marvelous list. You got this little checklist in verse eight. All you gotta do is when a thought is trying to land on the landing strip of your mind, you just run it through the grid. You just ask, is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it beautiful? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? You just ask, do, do the thoughts that I'm having right now, do they qualify? If so, landing strip open, airport open, land that thought. By contrast, though, if something that you're thinking, all of a sudden you say, but wait, that's not true. That's untrue. It's mean. It's wrong. It's nasty. It's ugly. It's vicious. It's shameful. It's dishonorable. This airport closed. No landing. You have to be the control. You have to exert the authority and say, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because the battleground is the mind. And you're the only one who can choose. You say, well, you know, it really, when you put it that way, it seems rather easy, right? Wrong. I'll tell you why it's not easy. If it was easy, I wouldn't have had any more problems ever since. I got it licked, right? No, the problem is, it keeps coming back. Why does it keep coming back? Well, I think we've got to look at a second thing to really understand that. We have to have a good, clear sense of who our enemy really is. It's not just our thoughts inside, but there really is an enemy um, who Scripture in John 10.10 10 says has always been about stealing and killing and destroying the enemy, Satan, the devil, he's always been about, and he doesn't waste his time with red little jumpsuits and pitchforks. He works through the mind. He works through the thoughts. This is where he gets his point of entry into it. 2 Corinthians 2.11 tells us Satan is actively trying to outwit us. And unfortunately, we're ignorant of his schemes. He's the master. Satan is, he's the master of deceit. And he's always going to be messing with your mind and always messing with my mind and trying to fill the skies of our thoughts full of airplanes that are loaded down with nasty, putrid cargo. It's saying, let me land that plane in your mind right now. And this is the reason that you and I have to learn how to wake up every day with an alertness and get to our post in the control tower of our mind and fill up on his word, on God's word, so that we can recognize, again, that thought is not of God. This landing strip is closed. Because if he can find one, he will bring his putrid cargo right down and it's exaggerated, it's overstated, it's nasty, it's irrational, it's fear arousing, it's just on and on. He'll land in your mind. And when that happens, 
Whenever you believe a lie, Satan takes over and claims what Chuck Swindoll calls squatting rights. He moves in and claims squatter's rights until you kick him out. This is why it's so important for us to take seriously this. <clears throat> I remember some years ago, I was in the home of some a family, wonderful family. They had their problems. I was somewhat aware to their problems. Um, and, but in any event, it was in the days before Netflix when you had to rent your movies from Blockbuster or you just bought them. And, and these, this family, they bought a lot of movies. I mean, they just racks and racks of movies. It was impressive. And I remember, um, I like movies, so I said, I'll just see what you got. And so I got to the shelf and I just began to look across one of the shelves. I only got about halfway over before I, I just said, I, I got to stop because my heart was sinking in an instant, I was understanding with perfect clarity so much about the anxious, frenetic nature of that family. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't you realize garbage in, garbage out. You reap what you sow. You fill your mind with this stuff. You shouldn't be surprised with what you're getting consequentially. This is what Paul was saying. He was saying, hey, you gotta, you got to check your thoughts. Is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it beautiful? And is it admirable? And is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? Or is it, or is it trash? Because if it's trash, you got to say no, bend down the hatches, close the door, lock the door. Because our enemy is real. And he is working 24-7 to try to get a foothold inside your mind. And he uses the most uh, pedestrian of means. I was just thinking this past week, with round-the-clock news cycles, MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, I'm telling you, with their round-the-clock stock-and-trade stories, many of which are at least partially true, but partially untrue, often mean, often just outrightly wrong, vicious, and on and on. Is it any wonder that we're all stressed out and freaked out? Garbage in, garbage out. What E. Stanley Jones said, what has your mind has you. Same with our conversations. Evaluate your conversations that you're having privately with people or the literature that you're reading. Rife with gossip. Garbage in, garbage out. What about your social media? What about your daydreams? What about your lustful fantasies? And on and on. The enemy is constantly putting um, uh, uh, his energy into trying to get us to let some planes land in our mind. And I'm telling you, if you put your mind on the ugliest parts of the world, and that's all you feed your mind on, then you'll get the results of it. You'll never be able to enjoy the peace of God or the God of peace. Paul, he was just genius. What he's done here in chapter four is he's given us several keys. He's saying, okay, look, if you want to get peace, then you got to do what we talked about two weeks ago, verses six and seven. You, you have to trade in your anxiety for prayer. you got to replace the anxiety with prayer. If you do that, you put your mind on prayer and talking to somebody, God, that is, who can change the dynamic, you'll, experience, you'll get peace. Today, what he's saying is if you want to keep peace, you've got to get control of your mind. That's what he's saying in the text today. Okay, so we've talked about what the battlefront is. It's our mind. We've talked about who the enemy is. It's the devil. But now we need to talk about a third thing. Is there any hope? Absolutely there is. There's hope for victory. So let's get to that. How can we have victory? By letting our minds get reprogrammed. We need to have an inter a new internal operating system. 
And this is what Paul called to the Ephesians in 4.23. He says, getting a new mind, a, renew, a mind that's renewed in Christ. You can think of it like a trade-in. When I think of a trade-in, I think of something that happened to Suzanne and me some years ago. I got a phone call one day, and it was a man on the other side of the line, and he said, hey, Pastor Ken, I just wanted to call you and um, because you've been on my mind a whole lot and, and been praying about you all, and it just keeps coming back over and over. And, and, and so, I, and, but the, I know this can catch you a little off guard, but, but I just feel like God has told me to, that I'm supposed to buy you and Suzanne a new van. Well, it, I'm like, is that legal? Of course it's legal. And, and we definitely need it. I mean, we're driving a jalopy. My gosh. And I said, you, what, to, wait, to be clear, uh, you, you're calling to say that you want to buy us a, a new, like the whole van? You want to buy us a whole van? And he said, yes. I, I, I just feel like that's what the Lord's telling me to do. And so um, how about could you just like go trade in yours and then you go pick out a, a new one, and I'm just going to take care of that. Um, do, do you think you could be able to do that? I was like, today? I mean, yes! Oh, my gosh! Thank you! Like, thank you very, very much. This I just wasn't expecting. I'm a little bit in shock, but this is amazing. Suzanne, our ship just came in. You know, I'm, I'm just like having this moment. I'm like, wow! Jesus is saying to you, hey, I would like to make a trade. How about you trade in your old mind and I will install into you a new mind, the mind of Christ. That's a trade, friends, that you can afford not to take. The answer is yes. The timing is now, today. Thank you very much. I'll make that trade. This is, friends, this is the good news that we call the gospel, that our God who saw us groveling in our sinfulness and our depravity here on planet Earth. He didn't just wad us up like a paper bowl and throw us in a paper basket. Instead, he said, I want to come towards you. I'm going to move in with you to your world. I'm going to come one of you because I love you. And that's when he sent Jesus, his son, to this earth who lived the life of sinless perfection that none of us could ever live. And then he died the death of punishment that you and I all deserved. But then he conquered the grave. He conquered death on the third day. And he says, now, if you will tether yourself to me, you too will have life. Not just everlasting life, but here and now. I'll give you a new life. I'll give you a new mind so that you can live full of hope, so that you can live full of purpose. This is the gospel. And it's the action step that some of you hearing my voice right now, you need. Because you've never said yes to Jesus before in the first place. And this is the step that you need to take. This is your actionable step today to say, I'm going to say yes to this trade-in. I'm saying yes to the gospel. I'm saying yes to the gift that you've come to offer. I want a new mind. I want a new heart. I want a new life. I, I want you, Jesus, to be my savior. But I know, I know, any number of you hearing my voice right now, you're like, yeah, I already did that. I did that like at a camp or a retreat. I did it a decade ago, two days, I did it a long time ago. I got, I did that one. You got anything else for me? Yes, I do. Well, I don't, Jesus does. Two things in particular I want to just mention here. The first one is the Holy Spirit. See, I don't think that most Christians understand the powerful um, opportunity that we have to live in victory with control over our thoughts if we could just but learn how to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. See, when you trusted in Christ, when you invited Jesus to come into your heart, he installed his Holy Spirit into you. His Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. He didn't just come to live inside of you sort of back in the back room somewhere if you could find him underneath all the piles of junk. No, no, he came into your life to actually lead your life, to be sitting in the driver's seat to guide your life. He said, now I'll take over. The problem with many of us who have already named the name of Christ, we've already trusted in Christ, is 
we don't, we, we resist his taking over. We're like, no, I'm, I'm glad that I've got my eternity ticket, you know, and that you're inside of me, you know, but why don't you go on to the back seat or the third back seat, you know, because I, actually I got this. I kind of like being in control and the folly of that, the irony is, of that is the more that we try to stay in control, the more that we get out of control, the more we lose control. And meanwhile, he's like, but I came into your life to save you to transform you. Would you let me have my rightful place? We see, we have to learn a whole new way of, of letting the Holy Spirit be alive in us, daily being filled by his spirit and transformed and daily saying, I'm going to resist that tendency that I just keep going back to, to get in control and you get in the back seat, Holy Spirit. I'm going to Today, I'm going to learn once again. No, I want you to be in charge. We have the same problem that many of the Americans had right after the Civil War. You know, right after the Civil War, you had thousands and thousands of people who'd been slaves. They'd been born slaves. They'd grown up slaves. They'd always been slaves. And then all of a sudden, the war is over, and they're not slaves. Slaves. They're freed. And that was a challenge for many of the slaves because they, they're like, now i got to learn like, how to live free. This is a whole new script. I, I got to learn how to do it. And, and similarly, many of those abusive masters, they had to learn a new way as well. And they had to be regularly reminded and driven back and, and, and reminded of the reality, no, you no longer have control over this person because he's free. And that's the very thing the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to do in you, to equip you to say to the enemy every day, every hour, no, you no longer have control over me. Wham! With the door, because I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit now. He gives us his Holy Spirit. That's one blessing he gives us. I'll give you one other one, and that is his word. He gives us a whole new script with his written word. See, the problem is that we've, we've uh, gotten into so many familiar you know how routines are, and, and scripts are kind of like that. And we, we, we grow so accustomed to, well, I always say this, or I always think this way, and this is kind of how I'm wired. And he's like, but it doesn't have to be. I came to give you life. Remember that trade-in? Um, but you're going to have to metabolize my truth, my word that I've given to you. And see, this is why we, we regularly talk about the power and the importance of the devotional life, where you take some time and you spend it every morning or evening, whenever it's your good time, and you read his word and you study and you pray and you actually keep a little journal and things like that that can help you to be growing in your relationship and in your awareness and your knowledge of his word so that you can wield the, the sword of the power of God's word. But so many of us, we, we're going around with this, so you don't have much of God's word in you. It's kind of like you've got a little plastic pocket knife and the devil comes and you're like, wah, wah. But, but, you, but you're not doing very good battle because you don't have God's word. In you. So it's so much do I want you to have God's word. I can't give you a replacement for doing your own devotional life, but I came up here on Wednesday night and I just started writing down a bunch of verses that I think are some of my favorite verses and I think they're powerful verses and, and turned them in <clears throat> so they could be printed for you. And, and you have those in your hand, this handout of just so many good verses that you could take with you, especially if you're like, I, I've never memorized the verse of the Bible. Well, you need to start. This will really help you if you would spend some time going through the words of God and beginning to memorize them. Try this one on for size. Just imagine what could happen if you were just to say, I'm going to take one of these verses this week and I'm going to memorize it. I'm just going to get it into me. And then when next week comes, I'll memorize the second one. And you just keep doing that faithfully. I'm telling you, uh, you know, b before we get to next winter, you would have a lot of good verses. And we gave you some blank space on the card so you can fill in a few uh, more verses that you really come upon and that you really like. And I thought of a number of others like Philippians 4.13 and John 1.12 and Isaiah 26.3 and others that I forgot before it went to print. But you can put those in and you can get God's word into you. Because those are the words that are going to give you life. Those are the words that are going to lead to peace.
peace. You've got to get his words into you. I'll close with one more word picture that maybe you can take with you and this can help you throughout the week. It goes back to Greek mythology. You remember your Greek mythology from high school literature or whenever you took Greek mythology? And <clears throat> I was thinking about how it was, they, you know, the sirens. You remember the sirens? Those apparently beautiful, alluring bird women who uh, would would sing their melodious songs from the cliffs of their islands. And that would lure the sailors. They would be like, we've got to go to the sirens. And they would guide their boats straight into those jagged rocks and they'd smash into those jagged rocks. And, and the sirens were not beautiful at all. They were savages and they would attack and kill the people in Greek mythology and they'd plunder their goods and they'd leave their carcasses dead. And then they would sing their songs again for the next ship that's coming by. But you remember that great hero in Greek mythology, Ulysses, and how it was that Ulysses had a strategy. He, he was like, you know what? To get by there without our sailors guiding our ships into ruin, um, he took a big block of beeswax and he gave each of his sailors on his crew some beeswax. And he, and he said, I want you to put this wax in your ears so that when we get to the island of the sirens, you'll not be able to hear their beautiful, alluring voices singing and beckoning, come over here, come over here. And they made it through. But, it, but there was one other I was thinking about who made it through. And his name was Orpheus. You remember Orpheus? Orpheus was known because he had the most beautiful voice in the world. And whenever Orpheus would sing, everybody would listen because there was nothing more beautiful than the voice of Orpheus. And so when his crew was headed by the sirens, he just opened up his voice and he began to sing. And all they could hear was his beautiful voice were the words that he was singing and lesser songs just didn't matter and they didn't have any enticing appeal to them because they just listened to the voice of Orpheus. Now, follow this. This is so interesting. If you go to the catacombs where those early Christians hid out and worshiped and prayed, wondering if they'd be able to live for another day, they found paintings in some of those catacombs. Paintings of Jesus, who interestingly, they painted as holding the lyre of Orpheus. They brought together their Greek mythology with their newfound savior. And what were they saying in that painting? What they're saying in that painting is, you need to listen to the words of Jesus. Just hear the words of Jesus. Don't listen to any other voice. Just listen to the words of Jesus because it's in Jesus that we have hope. It's in Jesus that we have life. It's in Jesus that we'll find words that are always true and always honorable and always right and pure and beautiful and admirable and excellent and trustworthy. So, so just listen to the words of Jesus. Cling to that word. Depend on his word and his spirit. And as you do, you'll sail through victoriously. And the God of peace will be with you. That was Paul's word to the Philippians. And that's his word to us today as well. Let's turn to him right now and talk to the Lord. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the gospel that gives us hope, that changes our lives, that for the reality that you've come to install a whole new mind into us. Forgive us, God, for, for how careless we are in this journey of life that we have. And we work our bodies out in the gyms and we build our muscles and we get eyeglasses for the outer part of our eyes and hearing aids and all sorts of money we spend on our hair, but we're not working on the inside of our heads where our mind is. 
And, and so, Lord, my prayer is today that you would make it for a turning point day in our lives. If you're hearing me today, right here, and um, you've never said yes to Jesus in the first place, that this is really where you would need to start right now in this moment. Say, I want to make that trade in. I want to trade my old life, my old mind. I want to trade it in. And I want the new mind of Christ. I want the gospel, the good news of Jesus and what he did on the cross. I want you, Lord, to come into my life and infuse to me your Holy Spirit. I want to be made new and stand forgiven. Why don't you give me life? But many of you, you've done that before. Perhaps the step for you today is to say, now, Lord, these last two things we talked about, won't you keep them in the forefront of my mind? Not just for the next hour or two or this afternoon, but tomorrow when I get to work. And Tuesday when I have meetings. And Friday when we have social events. Lord, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want you to lead me because when I am, there is peace. And then I want to be filled with your word so I have new script inside of me and so that I'm able to wield the sword of the power of God, the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would equip us and that you'd help us to act, and that you'd give us victory. I'm not even asking God that you'd give us victory for the rest of our lives, because all of us have to take this battle on day by day. So I'm asking for today, daily bread, you said pray for. I'm asking for enough for today. And then I pray, God, when we get to tomorrow, that in the morning, before we get up and do anything, school and work and so, that we'll come and say, now, Lord, I want more. I want more victory. I want more purity of the mind. I want more peace that you offer. And then when we get to Tuesday, that we would do the same and over and over. Once you come, Lord, and transform us. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the life that you give us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit. I'm the young adult pastor here at FaithBridge and I'm sitting with Pastor Ken who just finished our series, Calm the Home Down, Dealing with Anxiety. Uh, and just preached a sermon, The Anxiety Battlefront. Uh, and so we have a few questions come in, and so we're just going to jump right into those. Uh, the first one, uh, with pushing out all the negative thoughts and worry, what happens when we push and push and it all comes crashing down? Not because you haven't fully handled it over, but because the pushes keep coming and the struggles keep showing up in the battle. Yeah. Okay, so several thoughts uh, come to mind. Um, if we're truly yielded to the Holy Spirit and we're leaning in on his word and these sorts of things, uh, something that we didn't have time to get to, but it certainly could have been a letter C on number three, is uh, the power of community. Mm. Perhaps we need to get some people praying for you. Who's your community? Who are your people? Who's your small group? Um, the people that you know and, and that you're lifting up and that they're lifting up you. Mm -hmm. I think there's a uh, definite untapped potential here. In fact, I just was talking to a, a young lady uh, um, after one of the services who was saying she's had terrible anxiety, and um, but she talked about it with uh, some of her, her small group and they've been praying and she says it's, it's getting better. So she's seeing a little bit of a connection there. That leads to uh, an even more intense possibility, and that would be sometimes we need to go on just sort of like a retreat, like we offer periodically here called Kairos, yeah. where you can just do a deep dive into your stuff 
and surrender, surrender, surrender. And sometimes we just kind of have to um, uh, just really kind of do some soul surgery in an intense sort of way. And so I would mention that as a possibility um, if this is a sort of a, a recurring thing. Yet another thing, um, sometimes uh, where there's been abuse or uh, you know, real damage, the, 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 not fanciful things that are in our mind, but, but maybe derivatives from some real problems and pain that came about. There's n uh, power in a good biblical counselor and actually talking about these things and praying through. Uh, so I guess Kairos is sort of a, a, a quick weekend, intense experience. The, the counseling process is a longer process. And, um, I'd recommend both. And then I, I would say one more thing, Kyle, and that is because I did never get to talk about it publicly, we just didn't have enough time, but I think I did do it in the postscript after the first message. And I'll mention it here again. Sometimes some of our brains just need some help chemically mm -hmm. to create enough serotonin. Um, to, it doesn't fix the problem, but at least it levels the playing field so that we've got a fighting chance to do the things that we've talked about. I am such a person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I take uh, one of the SSRI medications, just a, a steady low dose of Zoloft, and it just, it, again, it doesn't fix my anxiety problems. I think it illustrated that. But it gives me a fighting chance, levels the playing ground to say, okay, I know what's going on here, and I know the tools, and I, now I'm going to choose to use the tools. Um, so, but I would never minimize the importance of medicine for, for some. Uh, I see it very much as a spiritual blessing, no less than I see the invention of aspirin that helps me because a cardiologist wants me to take that and it helps with the blood and the heart. And I'm like, praise the Lord that, that, it, that it exists. So I don't see it as a less spiritual thing, um, but as a super spiritual thing that God gives us. That's good. Um, the other question that we have uh, is, is where does the line uh, be drawn between anxiety and apathy to take it on to the other extreme? So if people, anxiety and apathy. Yeah. So when people are, not feeling anxious to the, the other extreme when they might need to or <laughs> yeah, might right, need to right, right, feel right. something. Right. Well, uh, that's an interesting question, and it definitely comes from a side of the continuum I'm not as familiar with. Um, I think of the famous Supreme Court justice who said famously one time of pornography, well, I know it, I, I, I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe that's my best answer here. Uh, perhaps, though, some things that we could run through the grid are, um, because this is a problem mm -hmm. uh, with some, are you, um, uh, are you taking care of your family? Are you getting to work? Are you getting your job done? Um, or are you just sleeping through, you know, all, all of this? And of course, I guess, really, you could get in this conversation into the conversation of depression, um, because that has some similarities to apathy, but maybe in the interest of time here, we'll save that for another conversation. Um, but those might be some a few prompters that come to mind right off. Yeah, that's so good. Um, well, Pastor Ken, thank you for uh, this series as we just kind of finished it up. I know it's been helpful for me, and I know it's been helpful for many other people. Um, as we deal with the reality that is anxiety. And so thank you for that. Yeah. And thank you for joining us Postscript. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.